Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for joining this fireside chat. Uh, speaking today will be Chung Cheng Kwong. She's a Hong Kong digital rights activist and the Hong Kong campaigns coordinator for Interparliamentary Alliance on China. We're also joined by ben Benasaya Siti, Siti Jira Watanakul, a Thai pro-democracy activist and a leader for the United Front of Tamasat and Demonstration. Uh, I'll be your facilitator Taylor today, and my name is Amen Thet. I'm the features editor for Frontier Myanmar, a news magazine focused on current affairs in Myanmar. Um, so uh, something that all three of us have in common uh, who are on uh, the, in this fireside chat today are that we are all used, working from exile from where we used to be, which were Hong Kong, Thailand, and Myanmar respectively. Uh, this is a rising trend among those of us who are working to keep our societies in East and Southeast Asia uh, more free and more democratic. And not only are we in a precarious situation because we cannot know if our host governments uh, will continue to be able to host us, but we also have to worry about our friends, colleagues, and families who were left behind, in some cases in prison. I personally have two family members in prison right now, a colleague who was recently released from prison, and my mother is currently wanted and on the run back in Myanmar. The work we do um, generally endanger, endangers uh, the activists and journalists who are working on this stuff. But to stop the work is also to allow that danger to swallow the rest of our communities unimpeded. So we're here today to discuss digital authoritarianism, which many countries in East and Southeast Asia are trending towards, including the increasing of surveillance, the removal of anonymity online, and the prosecution of online speech and behavior. In Myanmar, where I used to work and, and sort of the country I still focus on, much of the internet is now inaccessible without VPN. And most of the interdependent, inter, independent news outlets are outright banned, making much of the journalism that is being done technically a crime, as well as the activism and um, advocacy for uh, regime change, as well as for um, new elections and um, for democracy to be respected. Uh, technically also a crime. And the regime in control of the telecoms community, the, sorry, let me start over here. And the military regime in control of the telecom companies is currently used, actively using them to surveil the entire country to find dissidents so that they can be imprisoned, which often means that they're also being tortured um, and to try and stop the resistance movement against them. So uh, for our two speakers today, I would like to start off by asking whether some laws existing or proposed related to digital authoritarianism that you are most worried about right now, or alternatively, what do you think is the biggest challenge moving forward in regards to these issues in the context in which you work? Um, and I think I will ask um, Panasea to answer that first. Okay, uh, thank you for the question, and I can speak in Thai, right, and, and you do this as well. In Hong Kong, there are many people who are in the world. In computer, there are many people who are in the world. In the world, there are many people who are in the world. In the world, there are many people พอหลังจากนั้นเนี่ยพอมันมีพรบตัวนี้ขึ้นมาเนี่ยไม่ว่านักกิจกรรมหรือว่าประชาชนทั่วไปเนี่ยจะโพสต์ข้อความหรือว่าแม้กระทั่งแชร์ข่าว BBC ก็สามารถที่จะโดนข้อหานี้และเมื่อโดนพรบคอมเนี่ยมันก็อาจนำไปสู่ข้อหาอื่นๆได้อีกค่ะเช่นข้อหามาตราหนึ่งร้อยสิบหกยุยยุยงผูกพันหรือว่ามาตราหนึ่งหนึ่งสองเลมาเจเต้นะคะซึ่งไอ้ตรงนี้เนี่ยมันถูกใช้มาถูกใช้มาตั้งแต่ตั้งแต่มันเกิดขึ้นแล้วค่ะเอ่อหลายคนก็โดนซึ่งคนที่เคยโดนหนักที่สุดเนี่ยน่าจะเป็นเอ่อนักกิจกรรมที่ชื่อไข่ดาวดินที่โดนข้อหาเอ่อพรบคอมเนี่ยแล้วก็หนึ่งหนึ่งสองต้องอยู่ในคุกถึงสองปีกว่ากว่าจะได้ออกมาแล้วปัจจุบันนี้ก็ยังคงใช้เอ่อกฎหมายตัวนี้อยู่ค่ะซึ่งมันทําให้คนเนี่ยพูดพูดลําบากหมายถึงแสดงออกลําบากมากแสดงออกทางการเมืองหรือว่าแสดงออกในเรื่องต่างๆการแสดงความคิดเห็นเนี่ยคนต้องระวังมากขึ้นเพราะว่าเราไม่เราไม่อาจดูได้เลยว่าจะมีใครที่จะมาแจ้งข้อหา
เหล่านี้กับเราไหมหรือว่าเราจะเป็นเป้าหมายต่อไปของเราหรือเปล่าคะค่ะ Thank you so much um I think that's definitely something a trend we see in Myanmar as well where um we don't have a less majesty's law but um very common um legal codes that get used against activists especially are um, sedition as well as incitement um, and I think it's really interesting to note how often these sorts of things are tied to allegedly undermining the security of the country um, as opposed to kind of what they're really about which is insulting people in power or, or in people in power feeling like they're insulted. Um, Chang Cheng, uh, can we? Can I ask you the same question? Yes, of course. Um, in Hong Kong, it's quite crazy. Like in my opinion, I never expected to see that kind of thing in Hong Kong. Basically, we have a law called the National Security Law in Hong Kong right now that's being imposed since 2020. It basically criminalizes all sorts of dissents and political activities that are not like suitable in Beijing's eyes. Basically, um, if you are a local protester, you're basically terrorists. If you're encouraging people to go to protest, you, you fall into the same category. And if you, like me, are talking to like international organizations, foreign governments, then you're colluding with foreign forces. And it also has an implication on the online world. Imagine you actually don't know where the red line is when you're using social media or retweeting something that's related to, for example, calling for sanctions against Chinese officials online. That may be counted as like infringing national security law. At the same time, this law actually provides the government with immense power. And they can use this power against online service providers, platforms, and internet service providers. For example, they can request websites being removed from the internet in Hong Kong. And a few websites like NGOs in the UK called Hong Kong Watch is being removed from the Hong Kong internet by like a DNS tampering. So if you don't have a VPN in Hong Kong, you basically have no access to those information. And internet service providers are obliged to carry out this decision or else they risk criminal liability. And also they risk if they're not complying, they're going to be their like servers or whatever they use to host the contents will be removed by the government so that they can do it themselves. So it basically puts everybody in a very difficult situation. So as ordinary users, you start to second guess whether or not something it's okay to be said. And as service providers, you kind of face, you either cease operating in Hong Kong or you comply with national security law, which goes against the value, like for example, freedom of speech, freedom of expression that they that, that they want to uphold. So everybody is being put in this very difficult situation. And another thing is um, we we have something like a sedition law too, like as Thailand and Myanmar does. And the scope, we see the application of that scope, it's widening from criticizing the government, which is clearly in their eyes sedition, to commenting on government's COVID policy. People have been arrested for commenting COVID policies online, saying that we're not gonna use the Corona app because it has security concerns, to say, uh, privacy concerns. They, they get arrested and they get charged with sedition. Like there, they, there are a lot of like these kind of different cases that are ongoing. So we kind of see more and more laws being used. And it's not only like this very obviously politically driven laws. There are uh, like, for example, the government's proposing copyright amendment in Hong Kong again, which actually hinder free speech of on uh, online because they don't provide enough exemption for many common expression when it comes to politics, like memes, derivative works, user-generated content. They don't cover them well enough so that you kind of like, oh, I'm not sure if it's going to be a copyright infringement, so maybe I should stop doing it. And all of these laws all serve a common purpose, which is using fear to kind of lure you into self-censorship because the risk of speaking up is too high. And most people will have that mindset of better be safe than sorry. So to kind of like create a chilling, like it actually creates a chilling effect in the society and the people stop speaking about different things. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think the self-censorship angle is something that's quite important um, because it's not just, as you were saying, the legal repression, right? It's creating a situation in which the people essentially internalize uh, these uh, repressive government's uh, logics about what is and isn't acceptable uh, political speech or just any speech at all. Um, so that brings me to my next question, actually. 
um, which is related to self-censorship, um, especially because of the kind of harassment that people tend to face, uh, both legal as well as social. I think we've all seen kind of these armies of bots and trolls online that will go after um, activists and dissidents and, and journalists. Um, do you ever find yourself self-censoring and, and trying to mitigate harm, um, whether that is in terms of the exact wording you might use, um, whether or not uh, you talk about a specific topic at all, or like in terms of your timing, um, how, how are you kind of navigating the situation? Um, and uh, let's start with you, Chang Chen. Okay, I, I think I, 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 I muted myself, yes. Um, I'd say I do practice self-censorship, like I'm currently living abroad in exile in Germany. Uh, and I do engage in self-censorship still. Like there are things I know I shouldn't talk about because it will put colleagues and friends that are still in Hong Kong in danger. Like I will not disclose any details of them, even unless they give me like explicit consent, like you, you can talk about it to international media and so on. And when I was back in Hong Kong, I, I do observe that my, I am practicing self-censorship in real life and in online spaces because at the time I was helping a candidate in Hong Kong to run her election. And we would sit down and said, okay, this wording on the pamphlet might be problematic in terms of the national security law. Is there something we can change? How do we change it? How do we circumvent the red line? And that is basically complete, the complete opposite of what I just talked about, which is we shouldn't engage in self-censorship because it's how everybody stops talking about certain things because fear is contagious in that case. Um, and I think right now I still do too. I know that there are certain things um, that should not be said or else, I'll, as I said, I'll drive people into trouble. And at the same time, I know there are certain ideas that we're not supposed to discuss. Like, for example, any uh, any discussion, whether or not I, su I support it or not, about separatism on, in the international world. Like, if Uyghurs or Tibetans should have a say on, or should have self-determination, should Hong Kongers have self-determination? These things, we kind of refrain from talking about it publicly online as well, but it's not um, related to only to China oppression, but it's also related to how um, you want to be perceived in, in terms of the international movement in general, because a lot of politicians and governments are very afraid of talking, like touching on these topics because of Beijing reaction. And so we kind of have to navigate all of those norms and all those settings at the same time. So we do engage a lot in self-censorship, being inside or outside of Hong Kong. That sounds extremely familiar, um, but can I get uh, Vanessa to... Uh, add your perspective on that? Yeah, I, I think three of us have familiar experience of that. Uh, in Thailand, we, our uh, Thailand activists is, we, we try to push our bar to of the freedom of speech in Thailand because uh, one of the demands of the, our protest is about the reforming the monarchy, which, which is the very risky, risky uh, thing to, to do in, in Thailand. Maybe you can get killed or something, but you don't know. So when we try to push that, we, we try so hard and, and actually it's success for, for the, like, like the, the cultural movement. But after that, after we get the uh, put to jail uh, or arrested by the police, and several times, then we later later that we, we try to self center center again. Uh, we try to like uh, don't don't talk about about the the thing like too straight. Like we we have to like use uh, the symbol or use the meme or the uh, sarcastic thing to to say about that instead to. Go, go straight and say it because like we we don't we think we think that we don't want any of us to go to put to jail again because it yeah you know it's waste of time in the jail and you can do anything for the movement and also the relationship with the family is very important for me like I I'm 
I was put to jail like three times in the past two years, and it it become like a very big problem in our family because uh like the youngest the like the youngest daughter is going to jail and what what the others do for her and for right now I, I think everyone in in my family is uh over the stress and depressed but we yeah we try we try to get back together and recovering everyone but also this is this is like it's obvious that the government and who who have who that have the power like the king of the Thailand try to do with us that they try to like don't you if you don't say anything I don't I don't do anything to you. But if you say so, I will put you to jail or do any, anything worse. Uh and it's just like that. Today today now okay we have we have a uh, uh, more uh like a high higher bar of freedom of speech in Thailand but and we have uh some people who still maintaining that bar but uh now the older activists that fight fight before had to like uh the uh low lower lower our bar to keep keep like keep ourselves uh outside not in the zoo. Yeah, um, that actually brings me to my next question, uh, which is a little bit about how do you navigate um, the work that you do, especially when you know it can endanger not just yourself, uh, but your family and your the people you associate with as well. Um, I'm in a, I suppose you call it lucky position in that my the family members who are currently um, either imprisoned or on the run from the regime. Um, it's through their own activism. So it wasn't because I was out there being very rebellious. Um, but, uh, you know, it, the rest of my family didn't necessarily sign up for this. And I'm sure your families, different family members have different um, understandings about what you do and how they feel about it. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that as well. Um, and can we start with you, Panel Sakul? So yeah. Sorry, it's okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, this time I will I will say in Thai. So sorry. คือตอนคือมันมันอยู่ที่การพูดคุยในครอบครัวเนี่ยเราเราคิดว่าคือบ้านครอบครัวเราเนี่ยก็ไม่ได้แบบว่าเราไม่ได้ห้ามตามกัน
And what about you, Chung Ching? Do you want to add anything to that? I I'd say it's quite tricky for me personally too. Uh, like I ha I still have friends and loved ones who are inside of Hong Kong, and the way to protect them is basically not tell them anything because it's the easiest way to help them circumvent the risk. Like if they get asked, do you know what Chung Ching Huang is up to? They can honestly say, I really don't know, and then they don't have to pretend that they don't know. Um, but it's really, really sad to know that the things that you do actually put people at risk. In my case, like media has done interviews with me after I've been like quite active in terms of international advocacy. And it became proof in court that they're committing sedition. And those people I actually know in real life and we're friends or some colleagues sharing the work that I do and they're like, again, on court documents saying that this is the proof of violating the national security law. And it, it, you, even though you reasonably know it's not your fault, it's actually not you, it's the oppressor's fault, but you still kind of struggle with the fact that you seem to be putting other people at risk. And it's a very difficult to, difficult topic to talk to people as well, because you know your friends are going to be like, don't be silly, it's not your fault. But you kind of struggle with the guilt on a daily basis whenever you heard about these things. And I, I genuinely don't have a solution or navigate, like, how do I navigate with these things? I'm just like, okay, I'm going to live with it and see what I can do in the future. But at, at, at this moment, I'm still kind of struggling with all of the impacts that my work has in other, on other people. Yeah, no, I mean, it's definitely quite difficult. Um, and I think especially when we are all, we all had to essentially upend our lives and, and move to other places. It can be especially isolating um, to, to know that uh, not only can, are we in completely new spaces, um, we can't very, we can't talk about some of the things we're doing with the people closest to us. Um, I wanted to pivot just a little bit um, and maybe bring a little bit of optimism back into the discussion, uh, but, you know, I think something that I think about a lot is the fact that a lot of these regimes, these sort of want to be dictators are, even if they're not directly communicating with each other, they're definitely watching each other and learning from each other in terms of how they can repress uh, the, the, the countries that they have control over. So I was wondering if, um, from your perspective, uh, what are some things that the um, kind of, the movements um, of between our countries, of our countries are doing well uh, and whether or not, whether you think we are learning from each other as well and what advice you would give for other countries, um, for activists uh, and others in, in countries who look at a situation in Hong Kong or Myanmar or Thailand um, and they can take away uh, and to make sure that their countries don't follow down this path. Um, do you want to start, Chung Chin? Yeah, of course. Um, my my advice, it feels quite patronizing to say advice in a way. I'm in a position to advise you because we're all in very different situations. Uh, but my like really heartfelt things that came on a few levels, the first level is personal level. As an activist, as a human rights defender, as a participant of any kind of social movement, you really, really have to take care of yourself physically and mentally. That's your, your body and your mental health is your asset to actually do things. So you really have to take a break and avoid burnout in all situations. You have to make yourself a priority in some cases. I know it's very difficult. Like everyone struggles with it. Every activist I know struggle with it all, from all walks of different activism. And at the same time, I think um, we always have to, uh, on, and on an organization level, we always have to stay in touch with other movements and other things because more than often we have common grounds. We're all fighting for to be honest, the same thing, which is for a better world that we can all live in together happily and have like great lives and so on. And there are always lessons to learn from. I'm not saying we're directly comparable, but looking at what happened in Hong Kong and Thailand, there are so many parallels that we are learning from each other and trying to develop things and strategies that actually are developed by one another. And then we kind of evolve together. And I think this kind of support and this kind of organizational cooperation is like very important. And finally, I think we should all learn to um, to push our governments to do better for one another. It's not just Hong Kong or it's not just Thailand or Myanmar because 
the oppressors, they all have like common interests. And so do we as activists. So there is always ways that we can work together for fight for policy changes for different kind of like, like for example, in a vengeance sanctions regime, we all benefit from it because Thailand oppressors deserve to be sanctioned. Myanmar oppressors deserve to be sanctioned and China is too. And so we can all work together on these levels so that we can facilitate like better changes in the world. Yeah, I mean, I think something that was quite inspiring uh, this last couple of years has been the expansion of the multi alliance, especially. Um, I think every time, you know, people add like a, a new cup of milk tea, it's, it's really exciting to see. I mean, it's really tragic because obviously it speaks to how common uh, these repressions are. But I think it's also great to see that people are starting to understand that you know, all of our struggles are interconnected and that we have more in common than we have uh, differences. Um, yeah, Vanessa, yeah, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think it's like what you said. Uh, even we didn't uh, contact that much, but also we follow the movement in other countries from like time to time and adopt something to, into our own. Like, how, how like Hong Kong, Hong Kong demonstration, like the leaderless and do flash mob, flash mobbing using communication technology. And we, are, we adopt that to, to do in Thailand too. And also in Myanmar, like how to protect self with, uh, with a thing that you can find in, in your, in your, like your area is, I think that's this amazing and yeah we, we also adopt that to do in the uh in in thailand demonstration too and i don't know what what i should say more because like what you also say but i i actually i want to know like uh i want to learn like how how the activists in different country like establish and run their own organization like how to make it very strong and can put the people together like I, I i think in thailand we have we like struggle with with this thing right now and like, yeah we we want to learn from it. i think that's a really good question it's i think oftentimes even when people are fighting this great injustice. You know, people's personal egos can come and stand in the way. Uh, there's trust issues, uh, I think in part facilitated by these regimes, right, who try to undermine uh, collaboration between groups because they understand how powerful that is. Um, and then there's also just uh, the stress and uh, that can kind of make anyone make uh, poor choices. So I think we have just a minute left before we open it up to audience questions. Um, I think because we have such short amount of time, uh, just in like a couple words or just a sentence, can you uh, tell us why, why do you keep fighting despite everything? Um, whoever wants to go first, uh, maybe Pan Panacea. Oh, okay, I think, I think it's simple, like, we don't finish our job yet. That's why we will keep going on till we reach our goal. That's it. I, I just want to see democracy in China. I just want to see the, we, like we have a freedom, like really, literally freedom, like freedom of speech, freedom of anything, freedom of our own identity, everything. Like really, I, since I born, I never see that thing in Thailand before. Uh, but right now we we have we have a walk and we have a like go near that go like a little by a little but but yeah it it can it can be like for ten years or maybe for fifteen years or hundred years ten uh until we reach our goal but I I don't think I I will not continue this pathway until I will like accomplish my my 
my own job. Um, Chung Ching, just very quickly. Oh, it's, it's getting very emotional here. And uh, for me, I'd say it's quite simple. It's not because I'm optimistic in general, like any reasonable person won't be like that optimistic when it comes to situation in Hong Kong. But is that I simply believe what we're doing is right. We are fighting for things that we should have, democracy, freedoms, universal human rights, and all of those things. And that's the right thing to do. And it doesn't matter what it costs us. We have to do it. As she said, we haven't finished up here. And I don't want the next generation or the kids now in Hong Kong have to go through the same thing. I basically want them to have a life full of bubble tea and milk tea and, and they can like just live with that. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think that's quite inspiring. Um, so we have some audience questions. Um, I think I will ask two of them together since they're quite, or they're about similar topics. Um, and you can answer either one or both. Um, the first question is, is there an international market for technologies that enable digital authoritarianism and who is exporting that technology? And then the second one is, what would you like technology companies, especially internet companies to do to resist digital authoritarianism, especially given the legal environments that they are operating in? Um, maybe I can go first on this one. I think one of the biggest exports when it comes to surveillance technology, it's the Western world, the free world that we're living. Like we, we, we look up to, to be honest. For example, in Xinjiang, we all know that there's like heavy surveillance and European companies like Siemens, Telefonica, they helped build that system. And that system kind of reinforced and built the capacity for Beijing's um, power to conduct surveillance. And then they sell this kind of systems and techniques to other authoritarian states, and then they kind of export it. So it's not only Beijing's fault. We also should ask, why are European companies, why are US companies feeling this kind of crackdown indirectly? What are, why are they doing this? Of course, for benefit from money, but as countries, are we really accepting that as citizens? Are we really okay with those kind of things? So are we pressing our governments to actually stop the entities on our, our land, on our so like soil, like doing that? Are we going to stop them? I think this is one of the questions. And there is clearly a market and high demand of surveillance technology. And a lot of the developers actually have the power to decide where does it go. And we should act and put law and regulations in place so that it will not be happening to other places too. Do you want to add to that, Anasia? Yeah, like in uh, ในประเทศไทยเนี่ยเราคิดว่ามันเป็นไปเรื่องนี้มันมันดูยากมากสำหรับเขาเพราะว่าทุกทุกอย่างเนี่ยมันถูกผูกขาดด้วยนายทุนไปหมดเลยหมายถึงแบบนายทุนในประเทศไทยเนี่ยมันคือมันคลองคลองไว้เยอะแล้วคือที่ผ่านมาเนี่ยเอ่ออย่างไทยแอคซีวิสเนี่ยก็โอเคเคยโดนเคยโดนเจาะจากเอ่อเพกาซัสและการที่จะจอบเข้าเพกาซัสได้เนี่ยจอบเข้าโทรศัพท์เราได้เนี่ยมันก็ต้องอาศัยความร่วมมือจากเครือข่ายมือถือซึ่งทุกเครือข่ายมือถือในไทยก็คือให้ความให้ความร่วมมือแทบจะทั้งหมดเพราะงั้นเนี่ยหลายๆอย่างเนี่ยเราคือเราไม่สามารถควบคุมสิ่งนี้ได้เลยถ้าเราไม่สามารถแบบทลายปุ่มปุ่มขาดที่มีอยู่ในประเทศได้อะYeah, I mean, I think this is definitely an issue in Myanmar as well. Um, we definitely do see um, Chinese uh, state-controlled companies that come in and help, uh, and who helps the previous civilian government set up the surveillance systems. Um, but we also saw um, the uh, purchasing of surveillance technology from various companies, uh, especially in in Europe. Um, and yeah, I think there is this really big issue that people don't look at that is not just about the money, but it's also this question of Western countries, especially wanting to help development uh, without really questioning uh, who is in control of that and what happens if and when um, these authoritarian leaders decide they want to become even more authoritarian. Um, so we have another question. 
which is uh, what can we do to help build transnational solidarity to resist digital repression? And um, what are some suggestions that you might have uh, of how we can work together or some examples that you've seen of people working together? Um, and do you want to go first this time, Panacea? Yeah. เอ่อเราคิดว่าสิ่งที่จะช่วยได้เนี่ยคืออย่างอย่างน้อยที่สุดเนี่ยคือช่องนะคะมันจะมีแค่คนแค่บางคนแอคทิวิสต์บางคนเท่านั้นที่โอเครู้จักรู้จักกับคนที่อยู่ต่างประเทศมากจะเป็นส่วนน้อยมากๆเอ
which is that, um, well, I can't read my own writing, uh, <laughs> that, uh, you know, I think everyone here is uh, quite concerned about what um, the sort of danger that their work produces, um, not just for themselves, but for their family. Uh, that criticism of uh, oppression and injustice is often taken by these authoritarian regimes as sedition, as a threat to national security, or even terrorism. Um, I think some really important and interesting advice that the panelists had to give are, first and foremost, that you need to prioritize yourself. Um, I think as activists, it's quite easy to think of the work you're doing as a sacrifice and to, to keep sacrificing and keep working because you know the fight isn't won and the injustice seems so vast compared to yourself. Um, but you know, going to jail uh, is in many for many of us, it was a waste of our time, a waste of the contributions that we could be making if we were otherwise uh, not in jail. Um, and uh, we also need to protect our mental health in order that we can continue to do this work in the long term, um, especially if this is not a fight that's going to be won in um, either a short amount of time or even necessarily in our lifetimes. Um, another piece of big advice that came out of this discussion was that we need to be paying attention to and learning from other movements. Um, you know, the oppressors have common interests, as Chung Ching was saying, um, but so do we, right? And so if they can learn from each other, so can we. And the people, the power of the people is always going to be so much stronger as long as we can get to a place where we are united working together. Um, I think uh, another good point that was brought up also was about digital security um, and increasing the cost uh, for these authoritarian regimes and uh, their, their slow worker bees uh, when it comes to trying to either take apart our movements or, um, or try to uh, stop these movements. Um, I... <laughs> I want to bring up a tactic that was actually used in Myanmar, which the Myanmar government uh, is very archaic in the way it functions. And one thing that people did at the beginning to just waste their time was they programmed bots to just fax government offices random things. And it just wasted a bunch of their money and like stopped their ability to communicate. And I think the sort of like creativity is also something that is a really huge strong point of our movements because you know we are disproportionately young we are disproportionately tech savvy um, and even with all this technology all this money uh that these regimes have right like the three of us i'm sure have very little money combined together um and yet we and our groups are able to remain relatively free and relatively able to continue to do our work um, and then um, I guess I just want to end on a couple notes uh, that I, I found really inspiring about what uh, our two speakers here said, which is that they are continuing to keep fighting because the job isn't done. Um, and I think, you know, it can be really easy to get very disillusioned um, and, and to feel like you've done enough um, or you've personally put in so much. And there are people in your country who you know, are relatively happy with the, the status quo. Um, but I think it is, it's really helpful to keep in mind the idea that uh, Panacea was saying about how until the job is done, until we've won, um, this movement will keep going with or without us, and I would rather continue to stay fighting in it. Um, and I think what Chung Ching was saying about how what we're fighting for is what is right is also really important to remember because it is very draining on our mental health. You do hear people accusing you of all sorts of things, right? Of like, you know, being like a collaborator with the West or, you know, often said in much more sexist and violent terms. Um, and it can sometimes make you question yourself in your darkest moments. Um, but at the end of the day, what we're fighting for is right and the job isn't done. 
And so we will all keep fighting. And I hope everyone who is joining us today will continue to join us in that fight.